It's that spookiest time of year again. Supreme Court oral arguments. <gasps> Which civil rights are gonna die this term? And with that, let's get into the top 10 cases taking place in this fall term. Starting with case number 10, Moore v. Harper. Story time. Earlier this year, North Carolina State Congress approved a voting map that was gerrymandered to disproportionately represent Republicans. Now with everyone around seeing that it was clearly a map disproportionately gerrymandered to overrepresent Republicans, well, a Democratic organization took up the cause and sued North Carolina State Legislature to have that map removed. Now it's a yada 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 over more than a year of legal drama, the state court eventually said, yep, this map is clearly a map that has been gerrymandered for the benefit of Republicans. Now because of that gerrymandering, the North Carolina Supreme Court said, this map runs afoul with our state constitution. You see, in North Carolina, the state guarantees that all votes are created equally and that map would have diluted some votes and overrepresented others. Now because of that, the state supreme court threw out that map and well, that was the end of that, right? So why are we talking about this today? Well, for whatever reason, North Carolina's Republican controlled congress really, really, really liked that map and wants it to stay in place. Now they immediately got together the ultimate legal dream team and started crafting a very aggressive legal argument to keep that map in place. When it comes to matters of voting, they say, state legislatures can't be constrained by the state supreme court or even the governor. Now this belief is called the independent state legislature doctrine. It stems from a very literal and non-critical reading of the constitution. You see, if you read the document, it says clear as day, first line of the elections clause, the times, places, and manner of holding elections for senators and representatives shall be prescribed in each state by the legislature thereof. I mean, from an accountability perspective, I'm not sure I like where this is headed, but from a strictly reading comprehension perspective, yeah. Sounds like state legislatures have the power to craft voting however they want to. That constitutional part didn't mention state supreme courts or governors or anything else when it comes to drafting these specifically voting laws. Just the state legislature. Now this interpretation would mean that the only higher power for impacting state election laws passed down from the state congresses would be federal governments creating federal election laws that supersede those state election laws. So what's the argument against this? Well, it comes down to history. All right, sure, the constitution says that voting rules should be created in each state by its legislature. But at the time, and in similar cases to this one, that word legislature has been read as a sort of shorthand for the entirety of a state's government. You see, in America, states have a very wide latitude to organize their government however they want to. There isn't even a law saying that your state can't just sort of YOLO out there and do a parliamentary system. Alright, we don't have a governor and we don't have a congress. Instead, we have a parliament and a prime minister in our state. Now the argument on this side is saying, alright, they wrote state legislature, but that's less referring to a state's congress a more sort of catch-all term for, you know, the state government writ large. Now this interpretation would see the constitution saying, if a voting law passes through your state government as a whole, then that voting law is the law in your state. People are watching this case because it could open the door for state legislatures to have carte blanche access to rewriting their state voting laws however they want to, as long as those rewritten laws are in compliance with the minimal federal voting laws that have been passed by Congress. Next in line, case number 9. Another gerrymandering case. Now this time, it's not political, rather it's racial, I guess that's worse. Whole different ballpark though. Taking a step back, the big difference between partisan gerrymandering and racial gerrymandering is, well there's no federal law against partisan gerrymandering. 
but there very much is a federal law, the Voting Rights Act, that makes racial gerrymandering super illegal. If you're discriminating against Democrats and not minorities, well, the federal judiciary just isn't interested in your cause. Now, for clarification, the last case we went over was a partisan gerrymandering case, but it was a state court that threw out that map. And in fact, it was the Supreme Court deciding whether the state court had the authority to throw out that map because partisan gerrymandering doesn't run afoul with federal laws, only North Carolina laws. This is the weird and nuanced tension at the core of the second case. So story time. All right, Alabama created a voting map that was gerrymandered in a way that, depending on who you were asking, either disproportionately diluted the vote of African Americans, pfft, illegal, or disproportionately diluted the vote of Democrats. Cha -ching! Totally fine. Keep up the good work. Yep, this debate is about to get really weird. Literally, we're trying to separate race from politics. Now, under current Supreme Court precedent, in order to prove racial gerrymandering bad, you have to use underlying factors to prove to the court that this system isn't a political thing, good, but in fact a race thing. For example, are there enough African Americans living in close proximity to one another that you could plausibly, if you drew a better, more racially neutral map, construct a second black voting district without playing some sort of statewide game of connect the dots with minority households. All right, well, he lives here, he lives here, and this third guy lives here. Let's just make the voting district this circle, this circle, and this circle. Hey, we got another black voting district. That would not be a good case. Now, this also could include things like leaked communications showing racialized intent, or you could indicate that the lines are being drawn clearly across racial lines instead of party affiliations. For example, the black Republicans and black Democrats are on one side of the district line, and the white liberals and white conservatives are on the other side. Yeah, that looks only racial and not partisan. Now, the problem for Alabama is they're consistently losing in lower courts who find that the plaintiffs are able to prevent sufficient evidence that their gerrymandered districts were drawn specifically for racial gerrymandering purposes as opposed to for political gerrymandering purposes. Now, in response to all this, Alabama is poo -poo -poo, making the argument that we need to be changing this standard altogether. They want a new, weaker test by which a court can only throw out a map if the only explanation for its existence is racial gerrymandering. Now, in this new potential legal framework, if you could make a plausible argument that the map was partisan gerrymandering, well, then we're just going to assume it was partisan gerrymandered, even if you could make the same or stronger argument that it was racially gerrymandered. Now, put another way, this would be shifting of the burden from Okay, prove to me that this was a gerrymandered map with race in mind as opposed to a gerrymandered map with partisanship in mind. Instead, it would shift it to, all right, prove to me that this map couldn't have been drawn this way for the purposes of partisan gerrymandering. No, of course, this conversation would be a whole lot simpler if Congress regulated partisan gerrymandering as well as racial gerrymandering. But I wouldn't hold my breath on that one, or else your face is going to end up bluer than that one district that Alabama's packed all their black Democrats into. Next case, number eight, legislative pork. No, literally. California passed into law a bill saying that they'll only approve for sale pork from farms whose treatment of pigs surpasses a base humanitarian standard. Now, as most of you can imagine, pig producers countrywide are not at all happy about this new development. You see, California is 15% of America's pork market, and they're trying to leverage that 15% market share to improve how people across America are treating their pigs. Now, this all becomes a constitutional issue because of potential interstate commerce problems. Specifically, the fact that California is potentially messing with the sovereignty of all other states by making their production standards the de facto law of the land. 
You see, the pork industry is arguing in court that the Constitution provides safeguards against one state's laws burdening interstate commerce that that initial state is not at all involved in. This is an A to B transaction. See yourself out of it. Now they argue that when California refuses to buy pork that has been handled in certain ways, it's imposing significant costs upstream. It is California sort of dipping its toes into all interstate commerce. Now this argument has failed at lower courts because, well, to translate from all this legalese to average Joe speak, California is not mandating anyone do anything here. All right, so you don't want to make those changes? That's fine. You just don't have to sell things to California. Now this regulation might impose out-of-state upstream costs, but it's only cost to people who want to sell their pigs in California. Everyone else, you're good to go. No harm, no foul. Nothing is mandatory. Now, because of that, this, they say, is not a legally significant burden when it comes to interstate commerce. Interestingly enough, though, Joe Biden in the White House has actually weighed in on this case, siding slightly with the pork producers. You see, he really rode the median on this one, arguing a third compromise position here. This state law should be an unconstitutional law, because A, it regulates out-of-state behaviors, and B, the out-of-state behaviors it regulates involve issues that don't directly affect the final quality of the product that California would be buying. Now, most people think that this Joe Biden proposal was a sort of compromise to make it so that the conservatives didn't do the worst possible regulatory outcomes. This White House proposal would allow for other state product laws that more tangibly benefit consumers with end product quality to continue to stand with a Supreme Court ruling. For example, Vermont's requirement that GMOs label the products. Now, because of that requirement, most GMOs countrywide label all of their products as is, because most GMO producers aren't whipping up special Vermont batches with different labels. Now, the thing to watch in this case is what sort of test, if any, the court creates for evaluating constitutional costs and burdens that a state regulation can impose on out-of-state producers or what kind of costs or benefits should be considered when evaluating constitutional claims in this case. So next up, case number seven, water, something that I've heard is pretty key to continued existence. Now this case asks the simple question, when it comes to the EPA's regulatory authority, what is water in the United States really? You see, the Clean Water Act prohibits dumping a whole bunch of toxic chemicals into waters of the United States. Turns out though, when you have the most expensive lawyers out there, waters in the United States might not mean all waters in the United States. You see, to cut a long story short, one group wants to narrow the definition of waters in the United States to not include wetlands, while another group wants to keep wetlands in the classification of waters in the United States and therefore in the EPA's regulatory inner circle. Now this case has interest because its origins actually stem from an identical 2006 case, where the same arguments were being made to the Supreme Court. But the result back then was a tie. It was actually a 4-1-4 ruling. Now because of this, we got two separate definitions floating around for what water in the United States is. We got the conservative opinion that says, eh, water's in the United States, not including wetlands if they don't have a continuous surface connection to a permanent body of water. If the wetland only occasionally dumps into a permanent bottle of water, blew it away. Now the liberal interpretation of water in the United States dictates that if it flows into a body of water that the EPA protects, we should probably be regulating that body of water as well. Now in this case, the Supreme Court is going to have to choose which one of these two definitions to use in evaluating future regulatory disputes. And spoiler alert, the same people from that first case who want to read state legislatures very, very, very literally have the exact opposite perspective when it comes to reading the words water in the United States. Well, 
I don't know what they meant by that, really. I mean, we're talking wetlands here. It's just wet land, no water. Next, case number six, ice. You see, Biden's Department of Homeland Security released a memo that encouraged ICE agents to prioritize enforcement efforts against immigrants who pose a national security threat, public safety risk, or just generally threaten border security. Can't catch them all, so go after those guys first. Now this led conservatives to just get super angry and sue the Biden administration because implicit to that statement is an order to not prioritize the deportation of immigrants who are here illegally but aren't any sort of societal risk. Basically, this is like a more casual DACA. Yeah, we'll get to you eventually, but just after we catch all the criminals and then count all the grains of sand on the beach. Now, this case is actually on appeal after a lower Texas court declared this memo unconstitutional and filed an injunction. Now, what that injunction means is that this deferred action memo is not currently advising ICE agents. Long term, its fate depends on whether the Supreme Court, on appeal, reverses that lower court's injunction or not. Now, the overall question here really comes down to where the law ends and the interpretive authority begins. You see, the Director of Homeland Security and Joe Biden would argue, not changing the laws here. You know how when you got a long list of tasks and you got to do all the tasks, but come on, there's some easy stuff. You do that first and you push all the challenging tasks to the end. We're just doing that with immigration enforcement here. Those non-harmful undocumented immigrants, well, they're still on this list of people to deport. We're just going to keep, well, deferring action and focusing on undocumented immigrants who are actually hurting people. Now, the executive branch has the job of enforcing the laws that Congress passes, and they're doing so, just not in a way that you like. Now, of course, the other side is arguing that, while deferring law enforcement actions for certain classifications of people, is essentially looking the other way while bureaucratic crimes are being committed. You gotta keep enforcing the law, even if you don't agree with the law that you're enforcing. Does deferring enforcement of laws on specific populations by prioritizing the enforcement of the law on other populations fall under the category of law enforcement, which means that it's a presidential thing, or law creation, which means it's a congressional thing? Alright, deep breath, because that was kind of weird. Next, we got a refreshingly simple case. Case number five, affirmative action. Now, a bunch of earlier Supreme Court cases drew the lines on how a school can and can't use race in determining admissions. They firmly come out against a quota system. You can't say, all right, we want this many whites, this many Pacific Islanders, and you know the deal. That's bad. Can't do it. What you can do is have diversity be a compelling interest in determining who gets admission. Now this is because colleges have successfully, in the past, argued that diversity is added value to their student body. They cited studies that show diverse schools lead to higher performing graduates. Now this means that, when it comes to making decisions on the margins, you can factor in the diversity of your student body into your admissions decision making. Allowing diversity to be a compelling interest that colleges can cite when they're making admissions decisions has, of course, ruffled a few feathers. Specifically, it's disproportionately affected the Asian community, which is why a group of Asian students are currently suing Harvard University. They argue that Harvard's pursuit of diverse student bodies is leading them to select other minorities and white people as opposed to more qualified Asian applicants. Now, in their opinion, it's all a Title VI issue. You see, Title VI bans discrimination based on race, and colleges pursuing diversity therefore shouldn't be able to cite that diversity as a compelling interest in their admissions process. It's discrimination. Now, even though that might lead to tangible value-added benefits for the student body as a whole, it still is discrimination to strive for a diverse student body and make decisions based on that. Now, it's likely that diversity as a compelling interest will get shot down by the next Supreme Court, and that's kind of the end of that argument. Next up, case number four, 
the right of religious business owners to discriminate against gay and LGBTQ people. You know how so many movie sequels are exactly like the original but with a 2 in the title? Well this case is literally just Masterpiece Cake Shop Electric Boogaloo. In that case, a Colorado cake maker didn't want to make a cake for a gay marriage. The court totally dodged that question and instead simply ruled that behind the scenes Colorado systems had acted incredibly inappropriately towards the baker in question. And damn, if you don't want to make the cake, just don't do it. Let's not get the highest court in the land involved. In the end, the Supreme Court narrowly ruled in favor of the baker. And after years and tens of thousands spent, he didn't have to bake a cake for the LGBTQ couple. Very narrow ruling. Today though, Colorado is back at it again, and this time it's a person who wants to get into designing websites for weddings, but only straight weddings. No gay people have come to them demanding a gay wedding website, but instead this is all preemptive. You see, they want to advertise as a straight only wedding website company. It's very similar arguments to the Masterpiece Cake Shop case. But unlike the Masterpiece Cake Shop turning away gay weddings, in this case they've heightened the sequel drama of baking homophobia right into the core business plan. We're basically just slapping a no gays sign right on the door. Now before I get into the details and nuance, I want to clarify a specific issue. You see, currently gay couples, should they choose to work with this wedding website design company, would be protected from discrimination based on anti-discrimination laws that are in place. You can't turn away customers if your rationale is that you're doing so because they're a part of a protected group, in this case an LGBTQ protected group. Now, now of course if a gay guy is drunk and disturbing your other customers, you can throw him out right as quickly as you would throw out a straight guy. Your rationale just can't be that you're refusing someone's surface specifically because he's gay, or stemming from some sort of circumstances that would arise because of the fact that he's gay. Take for example, I'm not going to serve you because gay people make the other patrons uncomfortable. That would still be bad. Now I think this is important to note in this conversation because if someone asks you the hypothetical, well you wouldn't bake a cake for Nazis would you? Well then you just hit them right back by saying political parties aren't a protected class in this country. Recently a restaurant infamously refused service to Sarah Huckabee Sanders because she worked for Trump. That was totally okay, not a protected class. Now with all that out of the way, let's get back to today's case, because these rules put businesses that operate in the creative realm and are religious in a particularly strange place. Your product, many would argue, is essentially your speech. If a customer of a protected class approaches you, but you believe endorsing their identity will literally land you in eternal damnation, well, you got some pretty tough decisions to make there, don't you? Can the government mandate you to create some sort of speech for someone if your sincerely held beliefs are that that speech will land you in hell? Now this Supreme Court decision could have far reaching ripple effects, as if we're going to start designing website designers and cake makers as artists, what other creatives fit the bill? Can we have straight only hairdressers? No girls. No gay restaurants? Our chef doesn't want his art endorsing a relationship he views as sinful, or something else. You see, this opinion could also be incredibly narrowly tailored just like the last one, as creating a website does certainly include a bunch of specific types of literal speech, such as writing out at least some statements that are explicitly positive about the couple. You can't present him with a product that includes a tasteful rendition of it's Adam and Eve, not Adam and Steve, over a crisp fall background. Now everyone expects that the court is going to rule against the LGBTQ community in this case, but the question now is what's the damage going to be and how narrowly tailored is the decision? Next case, number 3. We're taking a detour from the emotional, trending on Twitter issues to talk about gutting protections for people on Medicaid. Sounds so boring it must be important. 
Now, this case is a bit strange to think about, but it really emphasizes the importance of civil suits in America. You see, in America, there are really two types of laws on the books. You got civil law, where you and I can go after someone for violating our civil rights, and you have criminal law, where the federales are kicking down the door and going after someone for violating criminal law. Now, a bunch of the lawsuits deli- A bunch of- A bunch of laws delegate enforcement to civil lawsuits. For example, most of the cases we've talked about on this episode so far. If a college is factoring race into their admissions process, or a company is denying you service because you're gay, well, state prosecutors aren't going to get involved in that. Call the ACLU and file a suit on your own. Now, this is all important to note because of a second thing that starts coming up that. A bunch of laws delegate enforcement to civil lawsuits. For example, most of the cases we've talked about on this episode so far. If a college is factoring race, a bunch of laws delegate their actual enforcement to civil lawsuits. For example, most of the cases we've talked about on today's episode. If a college is factoring race into their admissions process, or a company is denying you service because you're gay, well, state prosecutors aren't going to get involved in that. Call up the ACLU and file a suit. Do it for yourself. Now, this is important to note because of a second thing that comes up on the show every now and then. Standing. You can't just be willy-nilly filing civil suits for civil rights violations that don't affect you. You gotta be injured to actually file a civil suit. If I see on the news that some guy's being rejected service in Colorado because he's gay, I can't just take justice into my own hands and sue the business owner. It's not my problem. So how does any of what I just talked about fit into today's Medicaid Supreme Court case? Well, let's take a step back for a second. If you didn't like a law, but you couldn't overturn that law, an alternative strategy you could employ was to just severely limit the standing requirements so no one could actually sue for certain civil rights violations. You could essentially make enforcement of certain laws impossible while keeping those laws on the books. Oh, he won't serve you because you're gay? Ooh, I know it's against the rules, but not enough of an injury to give you standing to sue. He's got to do something a lot worse before we start to care. Now, this is what the stakes are in today's Medicaid Supreme Court case. The way Medicaid currently works in this country is, if a state wants to opt into the federal program, well then the federal government is going to start backing up dump truck after dump truck of cash into that state's lower income healthcare systems. We'll subsidize it like 75%, it's crazy. Now unfortunately for providers, and sometimes those states taking the money, that money comes with about a book's worth of asterisks and fine print. These are the rules that are attached to the cash. They include, if you take federal money, you got to provide coverage to all protected individuals that meet certain income thresholds. None of these rules are going to change. The question facing the court today is, if a state violates these civil rights rules, does the person being illegally refused coverage have standing to sue that state or provider? Now, under current legal precedent, you can totally take your state or provider to court for denying you your right to coverage under Medicaid. Now, this case, well, it can potentially buck that precedent. It focuses on the fact that these rules are strings attached to federal money and asks whether spending clause statutes give rights that are enforceable by a lawsuit. Now, as you can tell, this case is super technical, and I'm not going to go into the weeds on it today in this short, like, three-minute summary, but whoo, 
Oh boy, is this going to get its own future episode. If you want it, let me know in the comments. If the conservative majority agree in this case, the enforcement of all of these Medicaid and discrimination laws is going to go down the toilet. Now, if that were the case, the only remaining legal remedy for this Medicaid civil rights violating discrimination would be to, well, stop giving that state Medicaid funding until they change their behavior, break the rules, and find out. Now, that would have to be an executive branch action, and I think we can all picture how the politics of that action would play out. Next to case number two, Gonzalez v. Google. With Google in the name, you know that a bunch of lawyers just bought a new vacation house. Now this case is close to home for me as it affects how platforms like YouTube are going to be dealing with sensitive topics in the future. You see, under current internet law, companies can't be sued for legal content that gets posted on their website. The idea is that would sort of be like suing the owner of a bulletin board because some guy ran up and pinned bomb schematics to it. You go after the guy who posted the illegal content, not the medium it was posted on. Simple enough. Nothing's changing there. But this case says, alright, so you won't be held legally liable for things posted on your platform. Fine. I get it. Can I go after you for your algorithm steering people towards that illegal content on your platform? Now, instead of just illegal postings on a bulletin board, the bulletin board owner is going out and shoving those bomb schematics in people's faces. Hey, I think you'd be interested in this. This is fun. People like you like this. Is a recommendation algorithmic system part of our current environment of protected bulletin board posting law, or does the recommendation system go above and beyond that law and require different regulations? Now, this case was triggered because YouTube's algorithm steered someone towards radicalizing materials before they then committed a terrorist attack. Could you be able to sue YouTube for not the material posted on the website itself, but for leading the horse to water? And last, case number one, last one of the night, Native American rights. Now, currently, there's a law in the books that says if a Native American has to be removed from their family, but they qualify for admission into a tribe, the state government should prioritize members of that tribe when searching for a new family to place that person into. So, okay, this might sound like incredibly small stakes compared to everything we've talked about so far, but this is one of those start pulling at this string and you end up naked pretty quickly situations. Taking a step back, this case stresses the basic question of, hold on a second, is any of this within Congress's authority? Now this question becomes a bit clearer when you realize that, yikes, Congress is passing that adoption prioritization rule citing their authority under the Commerce Clause of the Constitution. Now, if intermingling commerce and Native American adoptions sounds at best strange to you, would you agree with the conservative side of this argument? So let's dig a little deeper, because with context, this all starts to make a bit more sense. So back during America's founding, there were three real entities that America was dealing with that all needed their own regulations. First, you got interstate commerce. Gotta keep up the product standards across state lines. Second, you got foreign nations. Gotta be setting baseline product standards for everything that your country imports. And third, well third you got Indian lands. This was a bit of a catch-all term for the foreign powers that were, well, foreign with an asterisk. Now over the decades, these three commerce regulatory powers have evolved in quite different ways. Take, for example, the State Commerce Clause. Now, initially, banning child labor and instituting minimum wages were considered unconstitutional because they weren't directly related to the product quality that was going from state to state. Not really an interstate commerce issue. Now, in the post World War II era, this was reinterpreted to allow Congress to regulate all economic activity within a state, including production. 
Now this reinterpretation paved the way for things like the Commerce Clause being able to enable the Affordable Care Act, as well as minimum wages and all sorts of other federal labor regulations. As you can imagine, Congress's ability to regulate commerce within Indian nations, well that's gone through quite the rewriting in the past few centuries. You see, early on in America's history, because there wasn't really a better substitute, this commerce clause for Indian lands quickly became the go-to law allowing Congress to regulate these bodies that were neither really foreign nor really domestic. You see, the founders didn't really write into the constitution a section that laid out exactly who had the authority to draft laws governing colonized lands. That, that would not be very within our declaration of independence. The latest Supreme Court interpretation on the powers of the Indian Commerce Clause came out in 1989 and says that the Indian part of the Commerce Clause gives Congress the ability to craft any laws they want to governing Indian reservations as long as those laws didn't violate any individual protections granted by the Constitution. So this brings us to today and the fact that Congress is currently citing the Indian part of the Commerce Clause to be prioritizing members of tribes when it comes to the adoption of other indigenous people. Now conservatives are looking at this whole duct taped together patchwork of regulations and precedent and saying, whoa, what does any of this have to do with commerce with the Indian nations? Alright guys, it's time for a great realignment I think. When it comes to usage of the commerce clause to justify regulations, we should be regulating indigenous commerce the same way we regulate interstate commerce. Not, not all this weird like family regulation stuff, let's stick to the economics. So with that reinterpretation, there are two major things that court watchers are looking for in any decision. First, if the Supreme Court decides to merge Indian commerce and interstate commerce, that opens the door for them to be really redefining the federal government's authority in governing not only Indian commerce, but also interstate commerce. If you're combining them, you can make tweaks to the system. Now I'm not saying that this is going to bring back the days where every day was bring your daughter to work day because of child labor. I will steer you back to the earlier part of this case when I mentioned that the current liberal commerce clause interpretation that justified all sorts of things like bans on child labor and federal minimum wages, well, that probably came during the lifetime of some of these current Supreme Court justices. And let's stack on top of that fact that Clarence Thomas has explicitly advocated for reverting back to the old system where we were just regulating products and not production. That probably won't get five votes though, so fingers crossed. Still, there are plenty of smaller tweaks around the edges that could roll back regulations without catching all the headlines. For example, Affordable Care Act. That was put in place under the justification of the state interstate commerce clause. If you're starting to merge and make changes, well you could just tweak that out real quick. Not saying that's going to happen, just saying all this is a possibility. The other thing we're looking for is the fact that a conservative opinion could fundamentally change the federal government's relationship with Native American governments by, as this whole thing would dictate, reducing America's ability to single them out in regulations not related to economics or product quality or whatever end term we end up settling on. So there you have it, those are the top 10 cases from the Supreme Court's fall term. Deep breath. I look forward to summarizing them in more detail and shorter episodes as the arguments and opinions trickle out. Sorry for the long episode, but you guys are the only ones who will voluntarily listen to my legal rants. Until next time, thank you and that's all I have to say about that. And I have to get some water because my throat is dry. Hello YouTube, I'd like to thank my patrons over here for helping me put out my videos. If you want to support independent nonpartisan news looking into the overlooked, Join this growing list of exceptional individuals by clicking on that link in the description. Also remember to give this video a like if you like what you saw, and lastly, as always, thank you for watching.